Hey, Tom here, Flip Anything USA. Uh, so, hey, today we're going to talk about land. Uh, you know, I've made millions of dollars with land. Uh, it is a fantastic place to start at, uh, at, at any level, to be quite honest. Green behind you. Uh, and uh, it, it's super uh, important that you understand that it is something that is totally achievable and doable. And uh, I'm going to have one of my students on here, actually, uh, Josh, who has been uh, extremely successful with the land business. And uh, we have several actually in the class. But uh, if you've got an interest in land, uh, then uh, you definitely uh, are in the right place. And uh, uh, so uh, hang out and uh, we'll get started. All right. Uh, so, uh, Josh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yep, yep, good. So I got Josh on here. Uh, Josh, I don't want you to say where you're at because, you know, listen, it, when, you, when you're when you in, you get in the mentorship, uh, and we've got a mentorship here, we'll talk about that too, uh, you know, at Flip Anything USA, we've got just the most fantastic uh, students you can imagine. Everybody's bright and smart, and uh, and uh, and many start making money quite quickly because they are uh, so bright and smart. And uh, so that's at FlipAnythingUSA.com. I uh, urge you to come visit. Uh, and uh, so, Josh, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how did you start, first start getting involved with land? Yeah, um, I'm just a bit about myself. I'm just turned 41, married, got three kids, um, was working just a regular job. Uh, and I got started in land because I, well, I initially, a few years ago, wanted to do real estate before I even discovered you or anybody. I just had my first kid on the way right. and was sort of in a panic. I did the math and was like, there's no, like you talk about in your book in the mentorship, did the math and figured out there's no way in hell I'm going to build generational wealth or leave anything realistically to my kids unless I get my butt in gear. And so I started looking at ways to make money found what they call nowadays wholesaling and at the time I was living in Albuquerque and just started going out every night from midnight to sun up just putting signs out saying we'll buy your house for cash even though I had no money um, got a few apartment complexes under contract and everything nothing ever really worked out because I didn't know what I was doing but it was um, a real good learning experience Good. So let's fast forward um, to the time. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So then you got yeah. in my class. Yeah. And, yeah. and what was your first deal? Oh, so my first deal was after I let that Albuquerque thing go, I figured I was basically crazy and there's no way to actually make money on real estate unless <laughs> I had a lot of money. And so... I said that I wanted to get my own personal house on some land and saved up some money and found a guy that was wanted to sell his property on seller finance. And so he gave me eight acres, 2,500 down, amortized over 10 years. And then I basically took that, found out that I didn't have the money to get a house and then split that down, sold it. And long story short, I made an eighty thousand dollar profit off of pretty much twenty five hundred dollars. Nice. And did did, did, there, did the buyer assume your existing loan, or did they cash out? No, there was a due on sale clause, so the original note holder had to get paid out. But obviously, you bought it. You bought it right, and you made some money. Oh yeah, like once I made that much. Well, you know. Just to backtrack a little bit, I had already been watching your videos for probably six months, and I don't even know how I found you, but 
there's a video that you do where you're walking down from way back where you're walking down a street and you're describing a story with you and I think your daughter Yeah, and uh, you come to a stop in the road where the sidewalk ends. Yeah. And I had already been working on the entity doing a lot of land stuff anyway. And yeah. when I, when you, I heard you talking, I just knew you knew your stuff. You were talking about, well, I came to the end of the sidewalk and it, it just ended and I knew it had to be a parcel. And I was like, well, this guy, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, I'm going to bring so that up. I had that Oh, sorry. Just while, yeah. while the class is watching. So j this is in my book, but, uh, this is, uh, a property I talk about. And, and this is like, I, I was walking along a uh, sidewalk the sidewalk right here. And I realized the sidewalk ended, which is an indication that there is a property here. They actually, this is where it ended right here. I'll take you on the street here and show you. Uh, and so just to give you the viewers watch and, and this is the kind of stuff I, I try to make everybody aware of uh, this property right here. You can see the sidewalk ends right here. Well, uh, if you know what you're doing, you, you'll, you'll know what that means. And anyways, uh, so that, that was a, a land buy and I had actually forgot it. I wasn't even going to talk about that when I wasn't even thinking about it, but that was a property I bought for about $42,000, sold it for $110,000, uh, like two months later, uh, and made 60 grand or a little more than 60, but I just say I made $60,000. So you got that story in your head. And then what did you do with that? Josh. So I knew I wanted to sell the property at that point, And I was like, what am I going to do? I don't really, I felt, mm, I didn't feel confident that I knew completely what I was doing and I didn't want to get taken for a ride. And then I don't remember the sequence of events, but you ended up offering a mentorship around that time. So I signed up huh. and you helped kind of guide me through getting rid of that first piece of land. And I sold it, like I said, to two different builders, four different lots. Each builder bought two lots. And I made, you know, an $80,000 profit nice. where I had only forked out 2500 down. So, and so yeah. from there, I just stayed in the men mentorship and kept rolling. Very cool. So if you listen to what you just said, he he'd bought 10 acres. He, he And so you did a subdivision on it, correct? So... I don't want to overcomplicate it, but I was unable to subdivide it because the guy who was holding a note, he did a contract for deed. So his name was on deed and he had already maxed out his split number. So wow. in the area where I live, you, you can only split five adjacent lots beyond that. You have to do a subdivision. Well, this guy that sold me the note, he was still on deed for those five splits. So what I said to the buyers is I was like, Hey, I know how to do all these land divisions. I just have to sell it to you first and then I'll do the work for free after the point. I've already, I had yeah. it all. So in, in, in short, so you did subdivide it. You, you did subdivide it. You just had yeah. a, 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 there was a detail in the contract. And see, this is one of the beautiful things you can do. The property that I just showed you that I made 60,000, I actually rezoned that property uh, in just a month. And there's some tricks on doing that. I'll get into if you ever get into the mentorship, those of you that are watching. But uh, so Josh, right off the bat, the first property he bought, he made, uh, you know, $80,000 uh, and with only $2,500 out of pocket. Uh, and uh, and what, what was your carry cost on that land after you put the 2500 down? My over, yeah, so it was the 2500 down and then let me just do the math real quick. It doesn't have to be exact. Yeah, my carry cost was about 4800 Okay. No. So then after that, uh, and I'm going to show, and then I want you to think about your second deal. And briefly here, I'm going to show everybody that's watching here. I'm going to show you a deal that I made $380,000 on. Uh, and this is back in like 1985. Uh, this is in Pear Blossom. Where can I, yeah, here it is. Uh, so this is a property, this isn't the first piece of land I bought, but this is really one, uh, somebody reminded me the other day when they were asking me about you know, good deals made. So this is in Pear Blossom, California. And look at this, look at this land. This is desert. This is desert in California. And I can tell you 
this was really cool. Uh, it was a very exci- I was very excited. Uh, a because I knew it was a good deal when I found it, and uh, and it just kept getting better. But basically, uh, and this isn't probably exactly because I'm a little bit lost on the street looking at it right now. But I remember I could see the aqueduct that you see here. That's the aqueduct going underground and coming back up. Um, but basically, I think it was this property right here, and I'll show the people watching. This was 70 acres I bought up here. And pretty much, yeah, that's this 58.9 acres. So it's probably a little bit higher. Probably it's a little bit more like this. Yeah, that was, that was it. That's the 70 acres. And this property I bought for uh, similar to, to what Josh doing. I put, I mean, I, I put 40, it was around 1985 or Oh, no, no, it was, no, you know what? It was 1989. It was 1989. I bought this property for $140,000. Uh, and, uh, and so I had to put $35,000 down, 25%. Uh, and then I immediately put it back on the market. And I resold that property for $520,000. Uh, and so I, I got basically, uh, I made 380000 and 300000 of that. Uh, was or 295,000 I got a note and so I remember I got about I had to pay commission out of that 380 I had to pay 30,000 roughly to agents uh, roughly six uh, percent of, of five you know, 500,000 and then uh, the other 350 was basically mine so I recouped my money plus so basically I got uh, about 70 to 80 thousand dollars cash in my pocket and now I had 2,500 dollars a month coming in uh, for the next, you know, 10 years, or that was the terms on the note. It ended up, I got paid off a lot quicker. That's another story. But, and that's the other beauty that when you buy land that's kind of in the path of progress, even if you do carry a note, the builders, and Josh is a builder, uh, you, you, you are in a position that you can carry a note and you can feel relatively confident that you'll get paid off in the short term because the other person is going to, uh, improve the property and the bank doesn't want to be in the second position. They want to be in the first position, which requires you being paid off when you're carrying the note. Uh, and, uh, but uh, so, yeah, so there's, there's right there, just so you know, that's a, a, a $380,000 profit and that's in the 80. That's like making a million dollars now. And, uh, and I've got other ones I'll share with you, but let's jump over to Josh again. And Josh, I'm not going to give away your area. I know you're not in California, but you are in kind of a desert plains area. Very, very similar to kind of what, what uh, I've got, what I have up on the map here. And your area, if you look at it, it's, you can just see sections of land, right? You can see dirt roads and squares everywhere, correct? Yeah, it's just like that, what you have on the map, probably what that looked like 20 years ago. Yeah. Like, it, like over there where you're at to the left or the west, yeah, or, yeah. Um, you're out here. Looks just like that area. Yeah, yeah. just flood. You can open area with flood and water courses, stuff you, like that. Yeah. Hey, and on that on that note too, people, you, you got to be very very careful with land. In as much as uh, you can buy a piece of land that looks great and find out you can't build on it or that it's in a, in a wash. And uh, just real quick, I'll tell a story. Uh, I I bought a piece of well, I shouldn't say. I, I bought, I, I had a property that I was in the mix with that I sold. And there's a lot you'll learn in the class about disclosing. Very, very important to disclose. But in the in the end, uh, basically, uh, I, I had a property I was involved with that was basically, see this wash on the picture here? Uh, and it was something that basically I, I uh, basically bought and sold. And... It was a square like this, and it had the wash running right through the middle of it. It was really not quite this wide. It was a very deep, but, you know, 50 foot by 10 foot deep wash. But it basically made the 10 acres uh, almost unbuildable. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, in my disclosure, it said property is being sold as is. Uh, the buyer is going to dig in and make sure that everything is perfect for their 
use. Uh, and I had owned, it slipped through my hands so quick, I had barely even looked at it. But I had such a good disclosure, it almost didn't matter. And uh, sure enough, they bought it, and then they resold it to somebody else for uh, quite a bit more. And what ended up happening was uh, they were trying to come back for somebody that's responsible for, uh, I didn't misrepresent the property, so I was off the hook. Uh, but the person behind me may have because somebody paid a hell of a lot more than it was worth. So anyways, uh, but so Josh, let's get back to your story. You made that. What was your next deal after that? Yeah. And just to touch on a bit of what you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just want to, you definitely want to do your due diligence. You can stand on a lot like you're implying and it looked like a beautiful lot, but you got to bring up a map like what you have. Look for these water courses. Every place will have its local G GIS map, and they're going to have FEMA-designated floodplain layer. If you want to click on that, if you can get contours. So it's not just what it looks like on the ground. you yeah. you got to make sure you're not in flood, for sure. Yeah, so FEMA is the, I can't even think of the member, but I used to, I've actually improved things and had FEMA take it out. In fact, uh, uh, you know, real quick, on that note, because I'm going to, this is actually a good, this is kind of, going off into a lot of directions you guys are watching you're lucky because we're going into stuff that a lot of people have no clue about uh so i'm going to go to a property i bought actually uh in a place called leander texas and i actually made uh i had a partner on this one third partner i own two thirds of it uh we bought this for two hundred thousand dollars uh, and then i picked up the lot next door for another hundred but we sold it for two two point eight five million so two million eight hundred and fifty thousand uh paid uh two hundred and ten thousand for the the bulk of it uh and this lot just to give you an idea because it's now covered with uh, uh it's covered with houses but see take a look at this and again who out there couldn't come up with 70 grand to put or actually come up with 200 grand uh to buy something uh and resell it for uh in this case, it'd be uh, 2.5 million. So yeah, that's what this property was shaped like, just like this. Yeah, kind of, sort of. It's a little bit, there it is, this is more like it. But this is 62 acres. Uh, I'm sorry, 50, 52 acres. Uh, and like I said, I had less than $300,000 in it. And uh, I sold it for $2.85 million dollars. And uh, that was cash. That was cash because it was for a builder. And now you can see this is there's homes on here now. But this was a trailer park originally. There was a trailer park here, terrible trailer park. But uh, you know, it, and all the trailers are gone when I bought it. Uh, but uh, again, these are the kinds of opportunities you can make in land. So, anyways, go. Let's go back to you, Josh. Tell me about uh, uh, your 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 next deal. You made. Uh, you'd already made uh, the money that you made with the. Uh, uh, with the builders, and what was the next next transaction? Yeah, so my next deal, I had eighty thousand. It was like eighty two thousand, but I had eighty two thousand dollars, and I was that's the most money I've ever had in my life, nice. and to have it all at once. So I was in a way terrified to put that into something else. <laughs> I was part of me just wanted to take it, and hey, I had a good good event happened, let me just live my life. But then I decided to put 80% of it back in and immediately got two deals after that, wow. two land deals. Um, one was for a large 40 acre lot in a more rural area. So I, I work in rural, but this was even more rural. And so I got that one. And at the same time, I got another one, which was close to development, but still rural, a 10 acre. And I had got, I'll start with the 10 acre lot. I basically got that one under the contract. And then actually at the time, what got it under contract was told me about interest only seller finance. And I didn't know anything about that. I was like, oh, I don't want to pay the monthly. It's going to be so much. And then you said, hey, just offer them interest only. What's that? Well, it offers a lower monthly, but it in, incentivizes the seller because he can tell I'm getting just pure interest on I'm going to milk this thing over five years, but it allows you, the investor, a low monthly so you can strategize your next move and get out of it. Yeah, I tell everybody, so, 
pay is yeah. If you can get away with interest only payments, pay it. If people say, "Well, I want to, I want to knock down the principal," don't don't worry about knocking down the principal. You'll knock down the principal when you sell it. You'll make it disappear completely. But, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So got that under contract, interest only, and then it had a water course running through it, and so I did this whole breakdown, measured the whole water course, and just really beat the guy up in escrow. And it came to a point in the end where. I was confidently fearful. Like I was fearful to the point where, again, like I mentioned, I was afraid of losing that eighty thousand dollars, and I was about to bail. My due diligence period had expired. I said, "Screw the thousand dollar earnest money deposit. I'm calling these guys, the realtors, up, and I'm canceling." And that's when it came out that the guys going, the seller's going through a divorce. He needs to get rid of it. He'll take whatever you can give him. And this property was originally listed at a hundred thousand dollars. And so I said, okay, I'll give him $40,000 cash. And then he took it. And so although fear isn't the right place to operate from, it did give me insight into, like, I was confident that I was going to bail out. So the confidence aspect to just take it or leave it, I don't want it. It's not worth it. My spread's not there. That really allowed me to beat him down $60,000 off the price. Great. And then, so I paid cash for that one, closed, split that down into five two acre lots, and sold that, made another $80,000 profit. Damn. So, what are we oh, up no, to sorry. now, profit? Off of that one, yeah. Actually, off of that one, I made $107,000 profit. <laughs> so, uh, now you're at $187,000 yeah. profit. And that's what inside a, a year? Pretty, or how much time has much. lapsed by? That's within like, well, okay, if you take the point at which I sold the first deal and bought the next one and sold the next one, that's within three months. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, and so, um, and at the same time, I had that other deal kicking around that 40-acre lot, and then I made, I split that down into four tens and made, I got it written down here, I made 40000 off of that. And that was, I closed on those within like two weeks of each other. Wow, that's fantastic. So, it, and I paid twenty for that one. <laughs> so at this point now, at, at that point of the, the story that you've told so far, how much money had you made on land, roughly? At that point in the story, in profit, I had made... 80 plus 40 plus 107. In profit, I would say it's basically about 227,000. You could round it down to like 220 if you want to be conservative because, you know, I did have to buy surveys and I'm not factoring that in. So probably realistically 215 to 220 in profit. Beautiful. Yeah. So I've got some people writing in here. Meridian King just wrote, how are you finding these deals normally? Look, that's part of what you learn in the class, which I'll take a break here just to show you. Uh, I've got a mentorship going here and Josh is in that mentorship and he's one of the many success stories that we have in here. Uh, and, uh, but basically uh, if you want more detail on that, just take a look here, go to flip anything USA and uh, let me get rid of this. Uh, uh, go to flippanythingusa.com and basically you'll find what you see right in front of here. And, uh, you know, Rich here, by the way, it, you can see Rich in this picture here. Uh, Rich made over a million dollars cash between three deals. Uh, and uh, th there's other people in here. Uh, Chris here just recently made $80,000 on a single piece of land, and he made thirty on another piece of land just before that. And, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, I've been buying and selling land, uh, houses, large acreage, small lots, which we'll get into that next, uh, and uh, there's just nothing like real estate that'll make you rich, 
and or it can wipe you out. And that's why it really pays to have a good mentor. And so anytime you're going to hire a mentor, and I say this selfishly, is take a look at the success of the students. If they don't have successful students, then they must be not doing something right. Uh, but there's a lot of fake gurus out there. They have no history of success themselves. Uh, they might extrapolate, you know, a couple tiny deals into being much more than it is. But then they talk about their students and they're very ambiguous. Uh, they say deals and or they talk about you're gonna make this or that. And it's all very, very uh, fishy. And to me, it's a little bit sinister uh, because uh, you mislead people that you don't uh, to, 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 to tell them that you have expertise you don't have, and then they end up following that lack of expertise and they make nothing. And it's because the, the mentorship is, is poor. So anyways, I uh, urge you to go to Flip Anything USA. And by the way, I do a live webinar every Thursday night, 7 p.m. Maybe, maybe Josh, you can pop in and say hello if you haven't put the kids to bed yet. Every, every uh, 7 p.m. Uh, uh, Thursday nights and Central Time, and you go in and you talk just like this, but I show you how I made my first million and I've made tens of millions since. And But all these people you see in the picture here, these are guys, people just like Josh that got in the class and just put the fundamentals to work. And you can see he's at this point in his story, he's already made almost a quarter million dollars. And uh, so uh, thanks for that, Josh, and, and sharing that. And uh, let's let's keep going. What else can you can we talk about? Have you yeah. Done? I, I will say, though, you know, you got to have, and I, I think this goes towards, I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, you're selective on who you choose to let in, or at least you have, have been historically. And it, this is I true. Wanna, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Plug it, the class. The class really is great. With you right? you yeah. got to. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But the individual has to have the drive. I mean, anything in life, they you got to want it. Like you got to be sick and tired of being poor yeah. and say, not another day. I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. And you got to want yeah. it. And then, and, and then, then you got to work for it. Um, but, but you think exactly. about it that, like I say, he, Josh said he had $80,000 and it was the most money he'd had in his hands in his life. And it started with 2,500 and now it just keeps growing. And that's the story. Believe me. That's the story of many of my students. They'll say, I've got more money than I've ever seen in my whole life. And I've only been doing this a year or two years. Uh, you know, we have students that have made, you know, hundreds of thousands. We have students that have made millions. And uh, and that's the beauty of real estate. You, you, you know that you're going to always hit, you know, doubles if you, if you follow the fundamentals that I teach you. But you also will hit some grand slams once in a while. Um, and, and, but you got to be immersed in the business and, and want it. Like jo Josh says, you got to want it. Uh, and Russ just po poked in. He says, uh, good morning. Uh, great job, Josh, on your deal. Uh, Tom is always great content. Thanks. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Hey, by the way, everybody, I was lame at doing this, but please hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. If you're new here, uh, you'll learn a lot. And like Josh says that the people that are in uh, my mentorship, I do vet them. I don't let you can, you know, I urge you, I urge you to go there and sign up for the webinar up here in the corner and just click on webinar and you can sign up. Uh, also fill out the mentorship survey and get the book. Do all three of these things. Get the book, sign up for the webinar, get the mentorship survey. If you don't think that book is the best book you've ever read on real estate, then send it back or uh, uh, and uh, well, you can re get your money refunded. Okay, that's how confident I am. And, uh, you know, but just you can fill this out, go to the mentorship survey, uh, because the more you fill out and the more you do here, the more serious I know you are. And that uh, goes a long way to getting into the mentorship is demonstrating that you want it and uh, and that you're and that you're smart enough to uh, discern the the bullshit from the real deal um but uh, and fill this out and like i say the all these guys here there's there's just so many so many money makers in the class in fact i challenge uh, pace morby grant cardone chris crone uh, to compare uh, the profitability of students my students i bet have made more money collectively uh, and, it, and just a handful of my students, uh, and I've only been doing this a couple of years, to people that have been mentoring people for 10 years, you know, Grant Cardone, Chris Crone. I, 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 I haven't seen any testimony. Everything pales in comparison. So 
you want a good school, look at the students. And my students are excellent. And uh, uh, so I only pick the best and brightest, and, uh, but, uh, but everybody's free to apply. Anyways, uh, Josh, let's talk about something. I'm not sure as you might be as familiar with this. So on the screen here, I'm going to show people something. I used to buy up a place, and I bought over 40 lots, vacant lots. These are small properties. Uh, this is uh, uh, Elizabeth Lake. Yeah, Elizabeth Lake, California. So if you're looking at the screen, this is a puddle. Uh, they call, it's actually a pond. They call it a lake, but it's it's actually a natural sag pond, they call it. And this little pond, and this is like 30-plus years ago, uh, I just bought the hell out of this place. I, I bought lot after lot after lot, and then I'm going to get into some, you know, just like this. I just bought stuff all over. These are 50 by 100s. And I'm not pointing to the exact lots, but there's just too many of them. I couldn't even tell you. Houses on half of the properties that I sold back then. And this, it extended over here, you know. And, you know, I, I just, I pretty soon I had over 40 lots, probably closer to 70. I bought some with a partner. I bought some by my own. I started building homes there. And I was making about, I was making about, uh, by the time I sold it, and I, I, I could Buy a lot, build a house, and be done completely in six months. And I'd make, I'd sell the house for one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, seventeen hundred square foot house, then, and I'd make seventy grand. Well, really, I made twenty on the lot. So I had more lots than I ever thought I could build on. So I started selling the lots, and I realized I was making more by flipping three pieces of land than I did making on the entire house project that I had to go get a construction loan. I had to have an architect, I had the plans, I had to go through the bullshit at the city, getting the plans, you know, process and permits pulled and all that stuff. And so I built three houses and then I said, ah, that's it. And then I just started selling off the, you know, 40, 50 lots that I had. And it was much, much, much more profitable. But to Josh's, so he's got some land expertise. This property that I'm showing you, take a look, see this? Looks like a ravine, right? Guess what? That's the San Andreas Fault in California. Runs all the way. You can see it's a very direct line. Looks like just a giant crack across the country. And that's exactly what it is. You can just kind of see the mountain. The mountains begin on one side. I guess this is the tectonic plates, which I don't pretend to know that much about it. But what I do know, look at that, all the way. Let's see, it probably goes all the way to the ocean, right? Oh, then it starts. That's why they say, uh, see how it keeps going? That's why they say California's going to slide off into the ocean. Uh, but uh, if it did, this would become beachfront. Uh, anyways, uh, that being said, when you're buying in an area like this, uh, it, you, it's almost kind of like the dangers of having a flood zone. Like like Josh mentioned earlier, you got to be very careful buying in washes and things like that. Well, when you're buying property this close to the fault, every these these little these little lots, and I'll, I'll come down close here to show you. These are tiny. This is a typical lot right here. And I'll measure it up here, but it is likely a 50 by 100 or 50 by 110, something like that. And uh, let's do square feet. Yeah, there you go. This is 6,600 square feet. So I'm probably generous. He's probably mowing part of the vacant property next to him. But they're basically like this. So... What you have to do in a situation like this, we turn on the whiteboard some, uh, and I'll show you on a whiteboard because this is important stuff. And then, and then I want to talk to you, Josh, uh, if, uh, about percolation tests and that sort of thing. So real quick, I'm going to go over to the whiteboard here, and I'm going to just give you a quick idea of what happens when you have to get a... Uh, oh, a... Uh, Okay, what am I, who, am I th what am I thinking about? Uh, I'm getting too many. Uh, uh, a geologist, a geologist involved. Uh, so let me turn this camera on. I, I'm going to take you guys to the whiteboard real quick. Uh, let me get my big whiteboard on. Okay. All right, so... Like I was saying, uh, on these, uh, you know, you've got you got a subdivision, and you know, let's just say you got a road, and you know, uh, you know, it's 
typical subdivision is going to be like this. You got lots. Uh, this is a street. I think you guys can see that, right? I'll shrink it down a little bit here. Uh, well, when you're near a fault, uh, and there's two things. First, let's talk about if there's in a fault line, this is what you have to do. If this is a lot, let's just say that's a, a lot. Well, you have to dig a trench four feet deep, the length of the lot. This is like this, 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 this area here, that's four feet, four to five feet deep, about two feet wide. And that's so a geologist can walk in here. And what he's doing is he's examining the sides of that trench. He's looking at both sides. And one time a geologist says to me, he says, uh, he goes, oh, there's been recent activity here. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to build a lot. And I go, well, how recent? And he goes, about four or five million years. <laughs> okay. So to a geologist, that's, you know, could be short term. But, uh, but if they found what they called a scarp, uh, and a scarp is kind of like a crack or a, a shear point where they think the soil can change, uh, then you can't build. You can't put a house on that, right? So if you want to put a house, you know, a little house, you know, it's got to fit, but not on there. Now, so the house can't go here. That's a no-no, but maybe it can go here. So now you can put a house here, and uh, again, and then this part, and this is what we're going to get into next. I'm going to talk to Josh about this. Uh, you can put in a, a septic field. So you got a septic tank here, and then you got a septic field like this. Uh, so in this case, that works out. But if I get uh, a scarp or a crack, basically, um, take the news away. Now, if this if this scarp here goes like this, now there's no place to put the house. Make sure you guys see that. There's no place to put the house. Uh, and in that case, this is now non-buildable. You hear me okay? Uh, Josh, do I still have you? Anybody out there? <laughs> Sounds kind of choppy. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so are you guys following me out there on YouTube on that or not? It may be the mic's a little stretch. So the next thing uh, we're going to talk about is percolation. So like I said, in this case, uh, on this one that I just showed you, Uh, on, on the one I just showed you on the whiteboard, uh, I was explaining the scarp, if you didn't catch that, the, 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 that can make it non-buildable because you're in near the San Andreas Fault. Uh, and like I said, this lot obviously is buildable, but, but there were others in this area that were not buildable. Uh, so next thing, let's talk about uh, percolation. And you, you have to run perk tests out there, right, Josh? Yeah, if you want to do a side invest, or I mean any um, septic system. So yeah, everything out here is septic. Okay, so if you just got here, I'm talking to Josh, and what we're talking about is he's done really well uh, uh, making money in land. And we're talking about some of the things that we encounter with uh, making money on land. And a lot of that is making sure that the property is usable to somebody else. And so uh, aside from my complicated one that I just described, having to deal with, uh, uh, having to deal with uh, you know, fault lines, um, there's other things that come in. And a big part of that is sewer and or uh, septic. And so... All right. Hey, if I get choppy again, let me know. I'll try to speak up here. But uh, so when it comes to uh, uh, 
septic, uh, if you're going to put in a septic, you've got to make sure that the ground percolates. Mm -hmm. And Josh, uh, in your area, what does a perk test consist of? Because uh, for, for us, we, we would dig a pit about, I don't know, five feet by five feet. Uh, we'd end up going down. Oh, it didn't work. Uh, we end up dig, dig, digging a pit like five feet by five feet, and it would go down like this. And then at the bottom of this pit, uh, uh, and I'll just do a top view of the pit now. At the, at, at the, at the bottom of the pit, you would have to dig. Let's see. Uh, at the bottom of the pit, if this is the pit here coming from the ground, here's the ground level. Uh, at the bottom, you'd have to dig a, you would have to dig a one foot by one foot square. And then what they do is they go down there with like basically five gallons or eight gallons of water. And they pour it. We'll put some water in here. Uh, yeah. Well, you can tell I'm getting rusty on this. But you could put, they fill it with water. You guys following me on this? Can you see that, Josh? Josh, can you see that? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so what we would have to do is we'd have to dig a pit about 12 feet deep. At the bottom, a one foot by one foot square. You see here. And then they pour that water in, and then they time how long it takes for it to dissipate and go into the ground. And if, you, if, you, if, if this is like clay all around it, it, it it's not going to, it's not going to, it's just, it's not going to work. It's not going to perk. Uh, a lot of times if you hit water, if you hit water at a level that's, you know, before you can even get to your, the, the hole where you have your pit or your water test, then this is going to be non-buildable. They'll shut you down for that. Uh, but if things go right and everything perks right and the water, you know, dissipates fairly quickly, then that's going to mean that when you go to build your house, let's just say this is your house now. Uh, let me black the pit. Let's just say this is your house here. Make it a little darker. <sighs> Then what? Then what'll happen is is that your you, you got your septic tank and now your leach field. It may only have to be that big, but if it takes twice as long for the water to soak in, then this may grow to be in twice the size. Uh, and if it needs to be so big that your lot can't contain it, then now you're shut down, or you're not going to be able to build as big a home. They'll limit you to a, say, a two-bedroom house, uh, as opposed to a uh, uh, a four-bedroom house or something like that. Uh, anything you want to share on that? Yeah, one way to get around. So now you have alternate systems, Elgin's, and stuff like that, where you can bring in engineered backfill or perk medium. And so if you do get a bad perk, you can you can now install alternate systems which essentially replicate good soil. Yeah, I've seen some of those, and I've heard some negatives on them. A, they're a little more expensive, uh, but you know, there may be something new that I don't know about. Uh, but do they bring it up to the surface? Yeah, so usually when you get, you know, and you know this, when you get when you get a bad perk, usually you're get hitting an impermeable layer. So that means it's either hard rock or dense clay. And if it's hard rock, you can't go any deeper just because you'll break the bucket on the backhoe. So what you can do is you can stay within four foot of the surface and use chambers and then put your own medium in. And so, yeah, more shallow you can do. Okay, so basically you're saying you can dig out, say, a clay-like dirt and put in a different, more permeable fill. 
Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, so if you just got here, uh, I've got Josh here. He's a student, and uh, he's been turned into quite a land baron and moneymaker and developer out in his part of the country. And I tell my people to be cryptic. Don't tell people where you're at because you just don't need the competition swirling in your area. It's not a big money-making community where everybody uh, you know is in the same town. Uh, that's to me, it's a bunch of BS. But uh, we're uh, but. Uh, the, the people in my class were spread out all over the country and uh, everybody does well in their particular area. Um, and uh, so Josh, I know uh, for development in your area, they've got, they're setting modular homes down in some places and others they're building. What is the, is there much competition between builders and people that uh, drag a modular building on or do you consider them the same? Uh, I pretty much consider them the, the same. They don't really compete with one another because the modular homes are more affordable housing, and then the people who are doing stick built homes, they're you know paying seven hundred thousand on up for a home. So they're not really in competition with one another, although they are in competition for the land. So they're fighting for the land, but yeah, and how, uh, like, you know, there used to be CCNRs that you could not put a modular home, couldn't put a mobile home, particularly mobile homes. You know, mobile homes can be kind of unsightly sometimes uh, and not conducive to keeping the values up in an area. Is there any of that stigmatism for against the, uh, uh, you know, is that is that something that is also associated with modular homes? Or But modular homes look so beautiful now. I guess yeah. it's not such a big deal, correct? Oh, yeah. And that's something I wanted to bring up too in the due diligence period and buy and write is you got to, I mean, you could step over a line and have a CCNR that holds no, no mobiles. And on the other side of that line, there's mobiles. So you may be looking at a lot and saying, Hey, this, this area has got a ton of mobiles. There's a lot of mobile home dealers and builders out here. This is a great lot. But then you, that's when you got to look in your CCNRs and deed restrictions because you might have a lot that, you know, excludes that. Right. And D yeah. so, yeah, you got to look at the CCNRs too. Yeah, there's a rule in real estate. But, yeah. The, the most restrictive restriction restricts you. <laughs> and it's the real thing. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, and there's, you know, once you get, learn all the little things too, and this goes back to your false scarf that you drew out. I mean, it, to somebody, it may be an unbuildable lot, but if you know your stuff, look at the dimensions of the lot, know the setbacks. So that's another thing you got to learn, learn your setbacks. You can, you can rotate that home 90 degrees, and all of a sudden it fits with the fault scarf, with the floodplain, with whatever else. So that's another aspect to a lot someone, some other builder or buyer may think is unbuildable. You can explain to them how it is. Buildable. Yeah, and then we've got hundred-year floodplains as opposed to a twenty-year floodplain, uh, and things like that, right? I mean, you can build in a hundred-year floodplain. In fact, that, that was one of the things I was going to show. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you guys a property. It's, I think that's the same one I showed earlier. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the 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 one in Leander, Texas. So this property, the lower part of it was in a floodplain. And so take a look. I have a, there's a creek here. See this creek right here, right up here. This is a creek and it, and it goes, flows and it goes underwater. I mean, it goes under, under this, as a kind of under a bridge under this property and, and it continues. Uh, this property uh, above, this property is uh, above. It, it's just, it's above the creek. This property uh, is, I don't want to say it's below the creek, but the creek is in between the two, but this is lower land. So if this creek was to overflow and fill up above the brim, it would go this way toward this road. And so there was concerns uh, about this being in, you know, not being quite uh, a hundred year floodplain, uh, or actually it was this part here below this. So... I had to deal with FEMA and I got thing, I got a report created and I ended up bulldozing out 
and just I just dug it a little wider. I just cleaned it up, really. I really didn't have to dig it deeper. I just made it a little bit wider, cleaned the edges out, and uh, it cost me about $20,000 for the, the, the FEMA report we had to create in a couple years, and uh, I got that done, and, and it took this out of the floodplain completely. And uh, But it, uh, you know, that, this is one of the things you can run into. It wasn't that big a deal, uh, you know, but... You know, it's hard to say. Uh, things to get, you know, government seems to make things tougher every year. Uh, it used to be, hey, how can we help you? No, it's, yeah. how can we stop you? <laughs> so, unfortunately. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's another niche, too, is, um, so FEMA, when they do these studies, a person doesn't come out and shoot elevation. These what's, are made what's FEMA in an stand for? somewhere. In- FEMA's flood? What's federal it? Emergency Management. Oh, Federal Emergency. It's federal Emergency Management Agency. Agency, yeah. I always think it's flood because every time yeah, I have had to deal so, with them, it's about land. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, they do hurricanes and all types of yeah, stuff. But no, basically, yeah, sure. the FEMA flood plains are, are actually an insurance scam. They're uh-huh. a coercive monopoly developed by the government to give select insurance companies a monopoly on the insurance uh, for federally backed mortgages. So they don't, they want to get as much floodplain as they can. So they don't actually go out and study anything. So you'll have, like you, you mentioned elevations where the, the water is never going to go up beyond that elevation, but they've mapped it in the blue as a floodplain. So you can get, like you mentioned, a letter of map amendment or a letter of map revision from FEMA. So that's a good niche, too. If you can find an area, look at the topos, and you can logically see, hey, this, this where they're saying is a floodplain is 10 feet higher in elevation than the, the wash. Right, and you that's where I was on this. Yeah. yeah, I knew I could build on it, yep. uh, but I just had to jump through some hoops. Yep. Um, but, yeah, yeah, this is good stuff. We've actually, so those of you watching, uh, listen, uh, you're getting gems here, whether you realize it or not. And this is stuff. For sure. Yeah, you're really getting a lot of gems here. It takes a lot of time to understand and to experience and, and get these kinds of experiences and, and have this kind of knowledge. So, uh, but, uh, I, uh, this, so uh, we're going to just take a quick break here. One second, and uh, I'll be right back. You want to learn how to make millions of dollars in real estate? I've made tens of millions over my lifetime, and I'm showing people how to do it. Get in my free webinar. I have it every Thursday, 7 p.m. Central. Go to the link below, flipanythingusa.com slash webinar. Sign up for it. You can talk to me face-to-face if you want. Don't waste any time. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. You don't want to miss my channel. I've been doing it for years. So, anyways, uh, yeah, Josh, man, I appreciate you uh, hanging out, and we got to do this again. It's uh, been really enjoyable. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what's really great is so many of my students, uh, some had experience in, in real estate or different, you know, all bright, uh, but everybody's become like, uh, you know, just another peer that I can talk to. In other words, it, it's just been really great. Every, everybody's just getting so smart. And, uh, and even, you know, I'm even learning some things that as people, uh, delve into things a little deeper, one area of real estate more than another, uh, than I've even had to. So, uh, anyways, uh, thanks for hanging out. And, uh, if you're out there again, please hit that uh, subscribe button, hit that like button. Uh, Josh, anything else you want to add before we call it a quit? I mean, I'll just say, as you already know, Tom, we're just scratching the surface on stuff. Like, there's, we could talk for really endlessly, and that's where the mentorship comes in. I don't mean to do a shameless plug, but I mean, it's true. Like, we are just barely scratching the surface on just my, just my little niche of yeah. land in it, my area. So yeah. No, and, and that's I encourage true. people yeah. if they want to. Go ahead. Yeah, if they want to change their position in life, I mean, this mentorship is a great opportunity. It's worked for me, and yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Thanks, and really, and you know, and that's a, a big compliment. I appreciate that, and really, I, I got to throw it back at to you and the other students. I'm, I mean, I, I'm at a point where I'm ready to start investing with my students uh, because they are making such good decisions and 
turning into such fantastic investors. So uh, great. Well, thanks again, Josh, and we'll do it again here sometime soon. And uh, that's it. Right on. Thank you. Thanks, Josh.